right. Uh, hey, everyone. This is going to be uh, part three on our Echidna workshop series, which is about like how to use Echidna like a pro. So yeah, I'm super excited everyone is here. With that being said, let's just get started. So I'm going to talk a bit about the previous and upcoming workshops we had. Like uh, There were two workshops before this. I'd highly, highly encourage everyone to check them out if you haven't seen them already. They're um, a bit more like beginner friendly. So part one was about the basics and part two was just about like using Echidna on an actual fixed point math library. Today and uh, next week, we're gonna be doing something a bit more intermediate, which is using Echidna on like a real world code base, which is Uniswap. And we're gonna continue working on this next week too. Uh, the next, the week after that, we're gonna be talking about a much more complicated system and we're gonna be uh, using a, talking about you how to use echidna on those so encourage everyone to attend the uh, future workshops and also to check out the previous workshops because we're going to be building a lot on what uh, anish uh, did last time so yeah looking forward to it so some of you guys may have realized by now i am not anish and you are 100 percent correct uh, my name is justin i'm a security engineer here at trail of bits uh, you may have heard of us. If you're tuning into the second workshop, then you probably have heard of us, but I'm just going to tell us about uh, who Trail of Bits is. So our job is to help developers build safer software. And we do this by being R&D folks. So we use the latest program analysis techniques, like, for example, static analysis and fuzzing, which is what the topic of today is. We also have a lot of open source work and a lot of open source tools. So Echidna, obviously an open source tool, but we have things like Slither, Tealer, Amarna, Solsi Select. And I'd encourage you, if you guys are interested, to just check them out. So let's talk about what we're going to do today. And so today's agenda is going to be a brief, brief recap. Once again, I cannot stress watching the previous lectures enough because there's a lot of juicy information. Anish did an amazing job. There's so much you can learn about using Echidna. And we're just kind of going to gloss over the main points. Uh, I'm going to talk about what is an AMM, how does it work, swaps, liquidity provisions, the whole jazz about you know how Uniswap works. Then we're actually going to go through the code base a bit and see how it's implemented in code. And lastly, we're going to talk about some of the invariants and then testing. So yeah, looking really excited to it. So a brief recap, what is fuzzing? How do we fuzz contracts? And what do we need to keep in mind when using Echidna? These were all covered in the previous workshops, but I just want to give a quick refresher since it's been a week or so. So let's start with the first question, which is what is fuzzing? Because we obviously need to know what fuzzing is if we're going to try to fuzz stuff. So fuzzing is really simple. We're just going to generate a random input, test a property, and if it fails, we're going to save the input or we're going to stop. And we're just going to keep repeating this over and over and over again. And this way, we could get a lot more coverage and we can get a lot more guarantees. It's like a unit test, if you guys are familiar with that, is you generate a property, you test it, and then you make it pass or fail, depending on what the property is. So that just gives you one instance that you know something may work as expected, but there could be edge cases, there could be things you didn't see or unexpected behavior. And fuzzing is like unit testing on steroids. We're just going to keep generating random inputs and keep trying it, and this way we can get a much broader sense of when some when a property should hold or when a property should not hold. There's uh, something to note between traditional software fuzzing and smart contract fuzzing in particular. So. Traditional fuzzing is mainly just looking for panics or crashes in a program, while smart contract fuzzing is just look, is mainly looking for like assertion violations. So just making sure that a property should hold all the time. So we understand what fuzzing is now. Now we need to know how can we start. So there are four steps, and I'll be going over them just really quickly. So the first thing you need to do is identify your invariants and your system properties in plain English. You don't need to go into the low level yet and start thinking about how you would start coding up these properties. You can just reason at a very high level about the system and what it should do. So a really simple example is the ERC20 token, right? There is a total supply and there's a circulating supply. The total supply is the total number of tokens that can ever be minted. And the circulating supply is how many tokens there currently are. So a really easy invariant would be there should never be more tokens than the total supply. So the circulating supply should always be less than or equal to the total supply because you can't have more than the total supply. That's very high level and it's in plain English. So now that we've reasoned about our system in that way, what we can do is we can convert those to code. So we can just have an assertion that circulating supply is always less than or equal to total supply. And once we have our properties in the code, 
it's time to run Echidna and start testing for bugs. And then the last step is to find bugs or hopefully not find any bugs, depending on your perspective and what you want. But yeah, that's a very brief introduction on how you would start fuzzy. So one more thing I want to talk about is useful optimizations. And this is something that you should keep in mind, not only when you're using Echidna, but when you're writing a test in general. And it's that tests should have preconditions, actions, and postconditions. So Anish talked about this in depth on the previous workshops, but I'm just going to briefly go over them. Preconditions, we're going to scope the input space and basically create reasonable bounds for our variables. So if you're testing something that takes in two uint128s, it's kind of unreasonable to try to test it with a uint256, because that's not in the bound. In our preconditions, we should also do be doing things that should happen before the action. So at a more complicated level, maybe you need to transfer tokens, maybe you need to call a certain function, maybe you need a mint. All of those things should occur before you take the action. And that's why there are preconditions. The actions are what you're testing. It's just the state change or the call or and well, an action, right? It's just something that changes the state of the contract and leads to a new state. And the post conditions are the truths after the action. So let's go back to our ERC20 token example. Let's say we want to test that when minting, you can never mint more than the total supply. So the preconditions would be making sure that we haven't hit the total supply yet. The actions could be minting. And the post condition should be the invariant. It should be that after the mint, there's still less than the total supply, always. So these are basically just the truths after the action. Another thing that is very important, and I cannot stress this enough, is that coverage is your friend. You should be using Echidna with coverage mode enabled. And what coverage is, is it basically will just show what lines in the code Echidna could reach successfully. And this is really powerful, not only because let's say you're, uh, you want to test something with Echidna and then it fails, then you can go back, look to the code and see, okay, it hit this line and then this line failed and then it failed here. So you know exactly why it failed. But also when we're writing Echidna some, uh, tests, sometimes we make mistakes too. So let's say something is passing and you don't want that false confidence that it passes, but maybe you wrote something wrong. So you can go to the coverage, you can see, oh, it's hitting this line, but it sh doesn't get any further. So there's something wrong here. And you can edit your test in that way. So Echidna will save coverage in the corpus. And I'd encourage everyone to just check it out and see how it works. We're going to be doing that later today, too. So a last thing to talk about in terms of a recap is just internal versus external testing. So internal testing is we're going to use inheritance to test the target system. So as you can see, let's say we want to test a token contract. We can just inherit from it and create a test token and that has this certain property. So the thing, and Echidna has these three EOAs, 0x10,000, 0x20,000, 0x30,000. And Echidna will just randomly select one of them and it'll just call the target system directly with one of the addresses. The nice thing about internal testing is it's really easy to set up and the message.sender is preserved. So you don't need to do any complex initializations or setups, but the downside is it's only really viable for things that have single entry points and not more complex systems like the ones that we're going to be testing today. So contrary to that is external testing. So external testing, basically you'll have these same three EOAs, but instead of calling the target system directly, you'll call this middleman. And the middleman will actually take the action, as you can see, it'll call token.stake, and then it'll do something. So you basically go through the middleman contract instead of actually inheriting from the token. And this is very powerful for you know complex systems, for multiple entry point systems. It's a lot more robust. There are a couple downsides versus internal testing, which is that the message.sender obviously isn't preserved because it has to go through this middleman contract. And it's just a little bit harder to set up. But in general, when you're dealing with simpler code bases, you can use internal testing. When you're dealing with much more complex code bases, you can use external testing. So I'm going to take a sip of coffee. And if anyone has any questions. OK, there are no questions, so I'm going to continue. So that basically covered everything that I wanted to recap. And now we can get into some new content. And today, as I mentioned in the agenda, we're going to be finding invariants of something very important, which is this pink unicorn. You might have heard of it. You might have lost a lot of money with it. But it's called Uniswap. And Uniswap is an example of an AMM. 
an automated market maker, which is a very important DeFi primitive. So before we start fuzzing Uniswap, we have to understand what an AMM is because if we don't understand, we can't fuzz what we don't understand. And in order to understand what an AMM is, we actually have to look back to a traditional order book model. So there might be uh, people who have, you know, played around with stocks or done some exchange trading. Those all use order books. And what an order book is, is it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a book of orders. The order book will match buyers and sellers. So let's say you wanted to buy one uh, Ethereum for $1,500. Well, then you're a buyer and your $1,500 is the bid price. That's the maximum price you will pay to get one Ethereum. Whether it's fair or not is beyond the scope, but that's the bid price. Someone needs to sell you that Ethereum, right? You can't just click buy and then the Ethereum magically comes up. There needs to be an opposite offer. So, so the seller will sell at an ask price. Let's say there's a seller who wants to sell you it, one Ethereum at $1,500. So the buyer's order and the seller's order, they both go into this order book and the person who adds them is this third party called a market maker. So in our example, they will see there's someone who wants to buy one Ethereum for $1,500. There's someone who wants to sell one Ethereum for $1,500 and then they'll add those to the order book. Then the takers will see Oh, someone wants to buy at $1,500. Someone is selling at $1,500. So they're actually going to execute these orders. So the market takers will then look to the order book and they will basically just match these buyers and sellers. The bid price, so, uh, someone wants to buy at a bid price. Someone is selling at the ask price. Those prices are the same. And they will just basically match them together and the order is completed. You can buy one Ethereum for $1,500. Someone can sell one Ethereum to you for $1,500. And this is essentially how traditional finance has worked, you know, ever since the Dutch stock exchange, it's been like this for hundreds of years. And now I wanted to pivot and talk about the, an AMM. So an AMM stands for automated market maker. And in this model, there's no order book. So there's no buyers and sellers. There's not someone, you know, populating an order book to make sure, oh, you want to buy at this price. Someone wants to sell at this price. The pricing is just based on the pool's liquidity formula. So the simplest example of that is X times Y equals K, which is Uniswap, what we're going to be talking about today. And the price is actually calculated as a ratio between the two assets. So previously in an order book, the price was calculated as the bid ask spread. Someone wants to buy at this price. Someone wants to sell at this price and they kind of just match each other. Here, the pricing is done algorithmically. It's done mathematically. And the core idea is that every time you exchange, so you want to do a swap, you'll keep the pool invariant constant. So if we have X times Y equals K, whenever we're going to swap X for Y or Y for X, that pool invariant K will always stay constant. And this may seem pretty cool, pretty abstract, but an obvious question is, why do we need this AMM model? Why can't we just use an order book? Well, if we're on a blockchain, using an order book is actually really inefficient. So you'd have to keep track of counterparties every time because you need someone to, you basically need a buyer and you need a seller. So you need to kind of just match them. You have to keep track of all these orders and that uses storage and storage costs a lot of gas because it's expensive to store things on chain. So the user experience is actually pretty bad because let's say you wanted to trade something. Oh, you might have to wait for, you know, a couple hours or whatever until you can find a counterparty. You'd have to, you know, pay a lot of gas to use that. And maybe most importantly, in an order book, you need a centralized third party. You need the market makers and takers to actually add them to the order book. So it's not decentralized. There's no way of knowing, you know, maybe a market maker or taker will censor your order. And because we want decentralization on a blockchain, it's better to use an AMM model. So I'm going to talk about a, an example of this because that was pretty abstract, but I just want to know if there are any questions. So the question that I got is, does each subsequent Echidna run improve the future runs? Every time I run Echidna, it says it loads some transactions from the corpus directory. What does that mean? Great question. And the answer is yes. So as I said before, Echidna will store the coverage in corpus, but it'll actually use that those like previous corpus runs to basically build new transactions. So let's say when you run the corpus, Echidna will just reproduce the issues that it found previously. And the corpus holds like these interesting transaction sequences. And since these sequences are considered, you know, it hit, let's say it hits more lines, then Echidna will just reuse those sequences and then try to mutate them a bit to increase the coverage. 
So to answer your question, yes, each echidna run does improve the future runs because it stores everything in the corpus and as a, it takes the transactions in the corpus and basically does some mutations to them to try to get more interesting strategies. So awesome. So great question. Now I want to focus back on the example. So we talked a bit about this, uh, like this automated market maker. We talked about the pool formula. It's a little bit abstract. So let's just go through a concrete example and try to figure out, let's try to answer a very simple question because the pricing is done algorithmically. Let's say we want to swap X amount of token A for Y amount of token B. How much of token B are we going to get out? Well, as you can see by this pretty picture, the pool invariant x times y equals k, or the pool, that's the liquidity formula, which is this nice graph. We have on the x-axis the amount of tokens A in the pool and the amount of tokens B in the pool. And so what's going to happen is, let's say we spend A tokens, we're going to, and we gain B tokens, we're going to shift to this new position on the curve. So we can, since everything is done algorithmically, we can calculate it mathematically. To answer this question, let's consider two things. Well, we know that x times y, equals k and all trades keep k constant right because exchanges keep the pool invariant constant that's the core you know the core premise of an amm so therefore let's go through the math let's call delta x the amount that we're swapping token a for delta y of token b then we know x times y equals k right we're going to be adding delta x tokens into the pool and removing delta y tokens from the pool because if you're trading something you're giving tokens to the pool, and you're getting something back out, in this case, delta x and delta y, respectively. So k should still be constant, right? So then when we add delta x to the pool, and when we remove delta y from the pool, we should still have x times delta x time, or x plus delta x times y minus delta y. That should still be equal to k. And now we can do some algebra, rearrange, and we can actually get how much of token y we're going to get out. As you can see, delta y is equal to y minus k divided by x plus delta x. So this is a very you know, precise notion of given x tokens, given token as input, how much tokens are we going to get out as outputs? Well, we have a perfect formula for that. So let's see how it actually works in practice. This is a pretty picture I stole from the Uniswap docs, and I think it explains everything perfectly. So let's just go through it. So we have a trader. He wants to execute a swap. He wants to swap three of token A and get out some of token B. How much of token B is he going to get out? Well, we have this formula, so let's go through it. The pool currently has 1,200 of token A and 400 of token B. So what that means is we define the price curve by x times y equals k. So the k, in this case, will be 1,200 times 400, which is 480,000. So k is 480,000. We know the value of k. And we can use the formula that we derived to see how much we're going to get out. So let's just do some math. So delta y should be equal to y, which is 400, minus k, 480,000, divided by 1,200, plus the tokens that we're going to put in. So 1,200 plus 3. If you work this out, you get that this quantity right here, k divided by x plus delta x is like 399-ish rounding. And y is 400, so delta y, 400 minus 399, gives you one of token B out. And I think this example shows the power of an AMM, because if you can see on the price curve, we shift down to the pool end. And this changes the price slightly, because the reserves got updated, right? There's now 1,203.3 .3 of token A and 399 of token B. So now the new price will be slightly different. And in this way, we can always guarantee liquidity. So instead of having someone in an order book, for example, want to take your trade because you need them to, you need a counterparty to do a trade with here. If you want to swap three of token A for one of token B, you will pretty much always be able to do that. The only problem is it'll just get progressively more and more expensive. So you'll have to spend more of token A to get out the same amount of token B, and you'll just keep moving down and down on this curve until you have to spend almost a huge amount of token A and get very little of token B out. So the fact that we can always guarantee liquidity is one of the, you know, it's a very powerful feature of an AMM that's not present in an order book model. 
So I'm going to pause here and see if there are any questions. Oops, sorry. Awesome. So there are no questions. We can move on. So you may be thinking this all works like fine and dandy, but someone had to provide the 1,200 and 400 tokens to the pool because they don't just come out of, well, okay, I guess they do come out of thin air, but someone has to take the existing ERC-20s and put them in the pool. So who does that? The liquidity providers. These are another people or another group of people in the AMM model. And what they do is they provide a ratio of tokens to the pool and they get minted this special LP token. So if we go back in our previous example, someone had to provide 1200 of token A and 400 of token B originally, right? So those people, the, they provided 1200 of token A and 400 of token B, that's the ratio. They got minted the special LP token that represents how much liquidity they provided to the pool. And the interesting thing is, if this pool didn't exist, let's say the first person put in 1200 of token A and 400 of token B, what they would do is they would actually set the product or the, the pool invariant K. And because they set K, they actually set the token price. So since the price is calculated as a ratio between the two assets, if you, if you, the first person who creates the pool and provides the ratio of the tokens sets the tokens price. And then since they provided a ratio of these tokens, they got back the special LP token as a coupon that represents how much liquidity they provided. They can redeem that coupon and get those tokens back. So they'll give back the LP tokens, those tokens will get burned, and then they'll get, they'll pull the liquidity out of the pool. So we may be asking, well, okay, we can do this, but like, what's the incentive? What's the point? Cause this is all, you know, kind of pointless, but in practice, if we go back, there are, see that 0.03% fee on every single swap, you incur that fee and that fee actually goes back to the liquidity providers. So the people who provide liquidity, they get passive income. And I don't know about the people in the chat, but I, I love passive income. I, I'm a huge fan. So it's a really easy way to make money because all you do is you just take your existing capital, pull the liquidity, and you incur a fee on every swap. So that sounds pretty awesome to me. Again, everything we talked about was at a high level. So let's see how it would work concretely. So let's say there's someone named Bob and Bob is interested in DeFi and he wants to create a die wrapped ether pool. So on Uniswap V2. So what he would do is he would take 100,000 die and one wrapped ether. He would pull, put, pull them together and then he would get minted LP tokens. When we dive through the code, you'll see a bit how this works and you'll see uh, how exactly the tokens get minted. But for now, I'm just going to tell you, since he's the first person to create the pool, he gets minted this, uh, the geometric mean of the two tokens. So in this case, he would get minted 100,000 die and times one wrapped ether, the square root of that, because we're taking the geometric mean. So he would get out 316 die wrapped ether LP tokens. And Bob is encouraged to put up a fair price. What that means by fair price is he's encouraged to put up the real ratio, which unfortunately is not 100,000 die per one wrapped ether. If it was, maybe we'd be watching this from, you know, you'd be watching this from like a yacht or a penthouse. But anyway, if he puts up this ratio of 100,000 die and one wrapped ether, there are arbitrageurs who will basically just buy the more expensive asset and then sell it. And in this way, they will just add more of the expensive asset to the pool until the price actually reaches equilibrium. So in our example, they would basically keep taking out die and uh, adding wrapped ether until the price is roughly the same. So here's another pretty picture. And before I explain this, I just wanted to ask if there are any questions. Awesome, no questions. So. This picture kind of explains the same liquidity deposit flow. So we have a liquidity provider. They want to deposit three of token A for one of token B when they're already current like liquidity in the pool. So what they're going to get out is they're going to get out a proportion of the pool shares. As you can see, they're going to get out a certain number of pool tokens. And the key interesting thing to note is that 
More liquidity, well, as the picture says, more liquidity increases low slippage area. Let's think about why that is. So you have x times y equals k, and the more liquidity there is, you're going to stay within that green area. And if you noticed how previously, if we wanted to make a huge trade, we would move very far down along the curve. So if we wanted to make a huge trade of token, we wanted to trade like a million of token A, we would move way far along the curve and the price of token B would go down. But if there's more liquidity, it becomes harder to do that and we would just kind of stay within the green area. And since the green area, it's very, you know, close together, there's a lot less price slippage. So we would get, you know, we wouldn't have to spend a lot of money. And this is why providing liquidity is very important to make sure that you get a nice user experience that's not just completely wrecked by slippage. So there's one brief thing I want to mention, which is impermanent loss. I said there was passive income before, but unfortunately, life is always not that easy. And there is something called impermanent loss. What impermanent loss is, is the dollar value of your LP shares may decrease if the tokens change price. So I'm not going to go too much into it if you are first learning about, you know, liquidity provision and you want to start becoming a millionaire by being an LP. I'd highly encourage you to read up on impermanent loss and see how it works more. In practice, trading fees should account for this, but since, you know, everything is very volatile these days, it may not be the case. So I briefly just wanted to talk about it and show that it's not as simple as just provide liquidity and become a millionaire. So... That covers the two main mechanisms of Uniswap, which is swapping and liquidity provision. Now, let's examine the code. But before I do that, I just wanted to ask if there are any questions. All right, awesome. So let's actually do a dive into the code. So the Uniswap v2 repository has a core and a periphery, and the core is the core. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, that was that sounded very stupid. But the core is where the main logic of Uniswap resides. So the core contracts. That probably explains it a bit more. It's for something that, you know, has like billions of dollars of on-chain value. So, you know, it has all these like swaps and liquidity provision. You would think it's complicated. It's actually really not. It's very minimal and very simplistic. Like even in the Uniswap documents, they say it's possibly even brutalist. And I found that pretty funny that, you know, something with not that many lines of code and it's not very hard to understand you can power like billions and billions of dollars of value pretty cool so the core has two contracts it has a factory and some pairs well the factory its job is just to create the pairs so the pairs actually contain the main logic the factory will do this by basically creating a unique pair contract for each pool with the create two op code and there's some logic for you know setting the fees but the pairs actually have all the real logic so the pairs represent the liquidity pool. They keep track of the token balances. They're also an ERC-20 token, and they contain some of the basic swapping logic. So I want to break down the Uniswap v2 pair. So let's just go through it together. So this is the Uniswap v2 pair contract, and it imports a bunch of libraries they need. We see that there's some constants for the minimum liquidity and the function selector for transferring. We have three state variables. We have the address of the factory. We have the address of the token of both tokens, token zero and token one, because remember a pair consists of two tokens. So in our example, token zero could be die, token one could be wrapped ether. Then we have these two variables called the reserves. And these reserves essentially are like Uniswap, the pair's internal accounting for the balances, because there obviously are balance, like, you know, the EOC 20 balance of die and the ERC-20 balance of wrapped ether. But the, pair, the reserve zero and reserve one represent the internal accounting. Then we have some uh, very, we have a variable for the timestamp and these two variables for the price one zero cumulative and a price one, two, uh, one cumulative. I wouldn't worry about those too much. Those are basically for uni v2 TWAPs. If you're interested, I'd recommend reading the Uniswap documentation, but those aren't the main focus of our testing for now. Then, all right, oh, it's hard to see. Let me zoom in a bit. All right, uh, is this slightly better? Okay, so then we have this thing called K last. And K, if you guys remember, is the pool invariant. And this, pro this comment explains it perfectly. 
it's this reserve times this reserve. So K is always just going to be X times Y, right? It's the product of the two reserves and that should stay constant. So let's go through the code. Con let's continue. So we have this re-entrancy guard basically here. It'll just, you know, lock the contract so you can't re-enter and then unlock it. A helper function to get the reserves because if you notice, these are private variables, so there's no getter function generated. Another helper function for safe transferring, nothing too interesting there. We have a couple of events, and then we have the constructor. So as I said, the factory, its job is to create these pairs. So as we can see, the factory will create, deploy the pair, and in the constructor, we'll set the sender to be the factory. Then factory will call initialize on these pairs, assign the two tokens. There's a beautiful comment there that explains everything, which, and yeah. So now let's get into the actual logic part. Here's this update function. I'm going to come back to it later. And there's also this mint fee function, which if you remember, there's that fee that I talked about. That fee actually goes back to the liquidity providers by increasing K. I'm not going to get too into that right now. And finally, we arrive at the secret sauce, which is this mint function. So this mint function, well, what does it do? It mints ERC20 tokens, because if we scroll back up, remember the pair is also an ERC20 contract. So it inherits from the Uniswap v2 ERC20, and it has a special mint function that will calculate how much of the to LP tokens it should mint. So let's just go through and see how it works. But before that, I just wanted to ask if there are any questions. No questions? Sweet. So let's continue. We have this mint function. It will mint to some address. It has the re-entrancy guard, and it'll return this liquidity. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to call this get reserves function and get the actual reserves of the two tokens. Of So there's a reserve 0 that represents the internal balance of token 0, the reserve 1 that represents the internal balance of token 1. And what we're going to do is we're going to actually compare these reserves to the real ERC-20 balances in the contract. So as you can see, we get the two new balances. We get balance zero and balance one. And what happens is we're just going to measure those. And then we are going to, actually, this is left over from some debugging. That's not actually in the code. Let me remove that really quickly. OK, then what we're going to do is we're going to calculate these things called amounts. And what amount will do is it'll be the balance. So that's like the physical balance of the ERC-20 in the contract. And we're going to remove the reserves. So this way, we can basically get like a real account of how many, to of how many tokens are in the contract. And we're going to do the same thing for amount one. If there's a fee enabled, we're going to mint that fee. And here is where the real magic happens. The first thing we need to do is check the total supply. So as I said earlier, when I was talking about liquidity provision, when we have the total supply, what we need to do is if there's no, there, we have to mint them differently if there, there's no liquidity versus if there is liquidity. So let's look at how we would do that. If there's no liquidity, well, how are we going to mint the tokens? According to the geometric mean, like in the example that we had with Bob wanting to provide an outrageous amount of die for some wrapped ether. What is, how is the geometric mean calculated? It's calculated as the square root of amount zero times amount one. So amount zero times amount one, we're going to take the square root of that. And here we do something interesting, which is that we subtract minimum liquidity. And if we go back up here, we can see minimum liquidity is actually set to be a thousand. So this may seem unintuitive. And why do we really do that? There's actually a very good explanation for that. And it's pretty cool. So when we subtract minimum liquidity, this encourages small liquidity providers. Why? Well, let's say the first person who provides liquidity, they want to make providing one way of a token $100. That would turn away you know, small liquidity providers because one way being $100 is very expensive. However, for them to do that, they would basically have to burn 1,000 times as much. So they would have to burn $100,000 to make one way $100 because we're subtracting the minimum liquidity. This is like a trivial amount for most pools because the decimals are 18, but it basically is there so that you can't make one token share way too expensive. Then 
even though my IDE is being annoying. And uh, we're gonna mint those that the zero address that minimum liquidity. So this way we lock those minimum liquidity tokens, and we no one can prevent making one way way too expensive. So that was a lot to cover. I just wanted to check if there are still any questions. Awesome, no questions. So next thing we need to consider is that was in the case where there is no liquidity, but if there is liquidity, what are we gonna do? Well, I mentioned, I talked about this earlier, but those LP tokens represent the share of liquidity you own. So you can think of them as kind of like a percentage of how much of the pool you own. So for example, if someone puts in, you know, nine wrapped ether and nine die in the pool and you put in one wrapped ether and one die, then you own one tenth of the pool, right? So your pool share is 10%. So what we need to do is we need to figure out a way to mint liquidity corresponding to your pool share. How do we do that? Well, let's check out this formula. If the total supply isn't zero, that means there's been LP tokens minted, then the liquidity will be equal to the minimum of the amount of the first amount times the total supply divided by the reserve or the second token amount one times the total supply divided by the reserve. And there's actually a very cool reason why we choose the minimum here. So let's think about it because we want to provide a ratio. We want to represent the ratio of tokens that, you know, that you own in the pool, right? But if we chose the bigger one, what would happen is we would actually encourage price manipulation by providing liquidity because it increases the spread. And this is obviously not ideal. However, if we choose the smaller one, AKA the minimum of the ratio between the first amount and the second amount, what would happen is we'd actually punish people for providing unbalanced liquidity because let's say you provide the, an incorrect ratio of uh, tokens, then you would provide a higher ratio, but you would still get minted lower LP tokens. So in that way, we kind of encourage people to provide a fair price. Otherwise, you're just wasting your money. And I don't know about the people in the chat. I don't like wasting my money. So we should provide the correct, the, a correct ratio. Next thing to know is that we're going to make sure that we actually mint tokens. So the liquidity should be greater than zero. And then the arrow on this VS Code extension does not want to play well, but we're going to actually call this mint. And remember, this is an ERC20 token. So it just mints an ERC20 token to this address. Now what we can do is we can update the reserves. So I told you I'd mentioned this update function before. Let's get right back to it. Did I miss it? I did. Uh, it's here. So what we're going to do is we are going to, as the comment says, update the reserves and the price accumulators. So let's look at what we do. We take in a balance and we take in some reserves. We make sure that the balances fit into 112 bits. And then we're going to measure that we're going to just check the block timestamp. So this if block is just for updating the Uniswap v2 TWAP. We're not going to get into that right now. And then what do we do? We update the reserves. Really simple. Update just make sure the reserves are synced with the balances. That's why it emits this sync event. Another thing to notice is that if the swap or if there's a fee enabled, then when we increase the liquidity, the fee gets provided. I'm not going to go into that too much, but yeah, then we emit an event and that basically covers how liquidity provision works. This this contract also contains mechanisms for burning liquidity and this low level swap function, but this is a little bit more in depth and I'm going to save that for the next, uh, next video or next workshop. So that's perfect. Let's go back. There we go. So we understand the pair contract and we're going to understand the factory in a bit. One thing I wanted to just ask is, are there any questions? Awesome, no questions. So now let's let, now let's actually do the fun part because we were here to you know try to break Uniswap, right? And all we've done is just well now that we un we understand the system fairly well. We you know we talked about how it worked at a high level. We walked through the code. So let's start by finding some invariants. Well, 
the system obviously relies on liquidity first. So let's start there. I think that's a good place to start because we can't swap without liquidity and liquidity, you know, runs the system. So the first invariant, we can write it in plain English. Providing liquidity should increase the pool invariant. Why? Well, it's simple. X times Y equals K. If X goes up, if Y goes up, K has to go up, right? That should be fairly obvious. But who knows? Maybe there's a bug and billions and billions of dollars of value could be siphoned out. So let's try to find out if there's a bug. So now we actually come to the coding part. And I mentioned about internal versus external testing. So what we're going to do is we're going to use external testing. How do we do that? Well, the first thing we need to do is create a folder called critic. Add that folder, we're going to create something called setup.sol. Oh, this setup contains, as you would guess, the setup. So what are we going to do? Well, same thing we do with any Solidity file. We're going to declare the Solidity version. Then we need to import everything we need. So in this case, we are, need to import the ERC20, the factory, and the pair. The router is for another time. So let's just do that. Semicolon. Then we're going to import the factory and the pair. Pretty simple so far. I cannot type. Okay, so now we have everything we need, and you might be thinking, well, okay, let's start setting things up. But before that, we're actually going to need like the middleman, kind of like the proxy contract that actually does the external testing. So I'm going to create that really quick. Type in too much JavaScript. I take the const instead. So let's call this contract users. And what is it going to take in? It's just going to have one function that we're going to call. If I can type it correctly, we're going to call proxy. Proxy will take in an address called the target, and it'll take in some bytes of data, and then it'll be, and it will return a Boolean that indicates success and some bytes, some return data. So you're seeing that this is oddly similar to like, you know, a solidity call and you are 100% correct. In fact, let's fill out the function body. We want this to be able to talk, call other contracts in the system. So how are we going to do that? Well, it's very simple. We're just going to do target.call with the data. Low-level calls return the return data and a success variable. So that's all we need to do. Perfect. Now that we have the user set up, we can actually start with the setup. Are there any questions? Cool, no questions. So, well, the first thing we need to think up, think about is what state do we need in our setup? Well, we imported all these guys, so it may be useful to think about, well, we may need them, not we may, we do need them. So let's think about what we need in a pair. Well, a pair consists of two, con uh, two tokens, right? So let's create those two tokens. Let's type in one and token two. Those are the two test tokens. What else do we need? Well, we imported the factory, so we probably need a factory to create the pairs. And lastly, we need the pair. Perfect. So we have our state variables. Let's start initializing them. Here. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to initialize the test tokens. In fact, we have our two test tokens initialized. Then we're going to have to initialize the factory. But we haven't looked at the factory contract yet, so let's just take a look at that. So as I said before, the factory's job creates pairs. So let's look at how it does that. It has some variables for the fee, 
who the fee goes to, who gets a set where the fee goes to. We have a mapping for all the pairs, an array for all the pairs. We have the constructor. This takes in the person who gets to set the fees. So we can already start by doing factory is equal to new factory. And let's just say that we get to set the pair. Fortunately, we probably don't get to do this unless we deploy a pool, but that's fine. Then we set the fees. So we need to create the pair, right? That's the factory's job. How does it do it? Well, there's this create pair function. It'll take in the address of one token, the address of another token. It'll return the pair address. How does it do that? Let's go through it. So we make sure the tokens are the same because there's no point having a wrapped ether, wrapped ether pool. I don't know about you, but I don't really want to swap wrapped ether for wrapped ether. Then we basically take the address of the tokens and we sort them. The reason we do this is just to make sure that the create an ordering on the tokens, and we're going to make sure that the tokens are not zero because you don't want to pair with the zero address. That's not, that wouldn't be, be very helpful. Then we're going to basically make sure that when we get the pair, the address is zero. The reason we do that is because you don't want to create a pair that, for something that already exists. We're going to get the creation code of the pair, and then we're just going to use the create to opcode to create that pair. Then we're going to call on the pair, the initialize function. If we remember that, it's very simple. Just checks that the sender is a factory and initializes the pair with the correct tokens. Then we're going to populate the mapping of get pair token zero token one with the pair address. And we're going to populate the mapping in a reverse direction. This makes sense because a die wrapped ether pair is also a wrapped ether die pair. We're going to push that lastly, and we're going to to the uh, array that has all the pairs. Then we're just going to emit a pair created event. So we covered the factory. So, and we need the factory to initialize the pair. So how do we do that? Well, let's say the pair is equal to Uniswap v2 pair, since the factory returns an address. And we're just going to call factory.create pair. And we need token A and token B. Those are going to be the address of test token one and the address of test token two. And there should not be a semicolon there. Perfect. Our state is mostly set up. The last thing we need to do is create a user. So let's create a user. And this is just to simulate an EOA, you know, who's going to call the target contract, which is the pair. So we have our state set up. This is a good time to pause for questions, see if there are any. No questions. Awesome. So we have our setup done more or less. So now you might think we should start testing things, but I'm actually going to create some helper functions here. These will be useful for our preconditions. So first thing we need to do is we need to have a helper function that mints tokens. And it's going to take in an amount one and an amount two. These will be how much of token zero or token one to mint and how much of token two to mint going to be internal. And what we need here is we're just going to make sure that it mints the tokens. How do we mint tokens? Well, I modified that Uniswap v2 ERC20 contract to have this public mint function so we can mint as many tokens as we want. Unfortunately, this is just for testing purposes. It's not in the actual Uniswap uh, like ERC20 code base. Sorry. But let's go ahead and use it. We're going to call mint. We have to mint an account. It's going to be the address of our user. And the amount will just be amount one. We're going to do the same thing for test token two. And we have to do one more thing here, which is we just don't want to keep minting people tokens. We only want to make sure if there's no tokens minted, then we will mint tokens. Because we're not just going to keep minting more and more tokens on every test. So we can create a bear or on every fuzz run. So let's create a Boolean here called completed. And after we're done minting, let's just set completed to be equal to true. Perfect. 
So that completes one helper function to mint tokens. And then we're going to have another helper function called between. And between does what it sounds like. It asserts something. Well, it doesn't. It makes sure something is between a certain range if it's implemented correctly, which hopefully it is. So it's going to take in a value. It's going to take in a low. And it's going to take in a high. And it's going to be internal. It's going to be a pure function because it doesn't change state. And it's going to return uh, uints. So this is going to be kind of an abstract formula. Let's just walk through it together. So what we're going to do is we're going to return the low value plus the value mod the high minus low plus 1. Why does this work? Oh, this should be value. Cool. Why does this work? Let's think about it. Well, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to have a value, and we're going to mod it to make sure it's between the high and low range. So now it's between 0 and high to low, and then we're just going to add low to it so it's between the range from low to high. And this asserts that the value will now be in the range from low to high. Pretty simple. So with that being done, our setup is entirely done. I'm going to see if there are any questions. Awesome. So as I said before, external testing is a little bit more involved. Internal testing, we could just inherit from the pair and do it. But since we're doing external testing, I wanted to show everyone that it's a little bit more tricky to set up, but we've got it done. And now that we've got our setup done, let's not lose sight of the original goal. We wanted to test this invariant, which is that providing liquidity increases the pool invariant. So how do we test that? Well, we have our setup done. Let's create a new file called echidna test. As usual, we have to declare the solidity version we're going to be using. Awesome. We are going to need that setup file. And let's create a contract called echidna test. And it actually should inherit from the setup because the setup has a constructor that basically sets everything up. And we want to be able to use these internal functions. So let's do that. Cool. So what should we be testing? Well, we're going to be testing providing liquidity increases the invariant. So let's write a test for that. Why? Let's just call this test provide liquidity. What should it take in? Well, if you re remember, I'm going to go back to the pair. We need to have two balances. So let's just try providing liquidity in some random ratio. Let's call that amount one. Let's call the second amount amount two. Nope, that's not what I want. There we go. So, well, if we remember from the very, very beginning, we need preconditions, actions, and a postcondition, right? So let's start with our preconditions. What should our preconditions be? Well, the first thing is we probably want to bound these amount values in between something. The reason for doing that is because we have this minimum liquidity that we need to provide, right? So let's just bound the values to make sure they're at least bigger than the minimum liquidity, because otherwise, when we subtract them, where is it? Uh, here, it's going to underflow, and we don't want that. So we want to provide at least minimum liquidity. So we should make sure that we mint at least between 1,000 and however many tokens. So how can we do that? Amount 1, we're going to set amount 1 equal to that helper function that we used. And then it's going to be between amount 1, the value is going to be between 1,000 and Let's just make this. Okay, so that u at negative 1 basically means it can be between 1,000 and the maximum u, which is 2 to the 256 minus 1. So very big number. We're limiting our input space just by what we need. And we have to do the same thing for amount 2. Perfect. So we've constrained our amounts. The next thing we need to do is we need to mint some tokens. Because remember, if we go back to the pair, we have, it checks the balances, and it subtracts them from the reserves. So we need to actually have 
tokens in the pair contract, and we need to mint the tokens if we want to have tokens at all. So let's go ahead and do that. But we only want to do it once, right? Because we don't want to keep minting tokens on every single function call. So I'm just going to do if we are not completed yet, then what we can do is we can call mint tokens with amount one and amount two. Awesome. Is everything good so far? Are there any questions? Awesome, no questions. I'm going to take a sip of coffee. So we've constrained our amounts. We've checked, we've minted tokens. If we haven't minted them already, what's the next thing we need to do? Well, now what we need to do is we need to get our state before, because we're going to compare the state before and the state after to make sure our invariants hold. So let's get the state before. Well, the first thing we need, we should get is we should get the LP token balance before. And what should that be? Well, it should be the pair of So uh, what this will represent is how many LP tokens there were before. And ideally, they should increase because if we successfully provided liquidity, the tokens would increase, right? The next thing we can do is we can actually get the reserves because we need to multiply them together to compute K. And our invariant should be that K before is greater than K after, right? Yep, X times Y equals K. Increasing X and Y will increase K. So we're going to test. How do we do that? Well, we have... Let's call this reserve one before. Let's call this reserve two before. Or actually, I'll just make this for consistency with the Uniswap pair. Let's call this guy reserve zero before. Let's call this guy reserve one before. And we need a comma here. And how are we going to get these reserves? Well, there's a helpful function in the pair called get reserves. Awesome. Lastly, what we need to do is we need to compute k, so I'll just call this k before, and that should be equal to reserve 0 before times reserve 1 before. So the astute viewer may have realized, wait a minute, we're with solidity 0 0.6. You get these two units and you multiply them. That could create an overflow. Well, I would say you're right, but if we go back to the pair, these reserves are both uint 112s. So what's going to happen is if we multiply them together, we have a uint 112 times another uint 112. That's going to be a uint 224. And 224 is less than 256. So these guys will fit in with a uint 256. So there's no risk of any overflow here. Perfect. Now we have our state before. What we need to do now is actually transfer the tokens. So this is still in a precondition because we haven't executed what we want to test yet. But let's go ahead and transfer the tokens. So I'm going to call this full success. I don't really care about return data for now. If you want, want to, I want to type equals, please. OK, there we go. And how are we going to do this? Well, we have that user. We have this proxy function. So we need to provide a target and some data. So the address that we want to call is we want to call the test token the address of test token one. And on that test token, we want to call the transfer function. So let's go ahead and pick that as our data. We're going to use API encoded selector. The selector will be test token one dot transfer. Nope, that's not what I wanted. But selector. And the argument is going to be well, we need an address and we need an amount, right? The address to transfer will be the pair and the amount will be amount one. Sweet. Now we need to do that. I'm going to call this success one because we need to do that again for the second token, right? This time it's going to be test token two. It's going to be, we're going to call it abi.encode with selector by test token two dot transfer. They will have the same selector, but I'll just do test token two. And then we need to encode the arguments, which will be the address, the pair contract, and amount two. So we've transferred the tokens. 
Perfect. Now we just need to make sure these calls were successful. That's not how you spell success. Awesome. So we have all the preconditions done. Awesome. This would be a good time to stop and see if there are any questions. We do have a question. Questions. Could, couldn't you just mint the tokens in the constructor or is the testing contract not redeployed between campaigns? Uh, good question. So Echidna actually in the constructor does not allow random value during the deployment. So basically under the hood, what Echidna will actually do is it'll cache the deployed contract for optimization purposes. So if you wanted to, if we wanted to call like mint tokens in the constructor here, what would happen is it would actually uh, like mint a fixed amount and we don't really want to mint a fixed amount because then we're just using Echidna as like a unit tester. There's no point in that. So yeah, that's why we have to mint it, make an internal function and then mint it on every call. I hope that answers your question. Uh, all right, so that being said, let's continue. So these represent all of our preconditions and now we can get on to writing the actual action. What the, should the action do? Well, we'll take in Boolean called success three. And we're gonna use the same user.proxy style. This time though, we actually wanna test something on the pair, right? So we're gonna have to call the pair address and we're going to provide some data. So we need to provide the function selector and the argument. So the function selector, remember I modified this Uniswap v2 ERC20 to have this mint function. So if we just did what we did before here, where you could just call test token dot transfer or test token dot mint, it'll get confused because there's this mint function and there is also, where is it? This mint function here, here. So I'm actually just gonna calculate the function selector myself. It's pretty simple. It's just gonna be the first four bytes of the Kekak hash of mint and then the variable it takes in, sweet. And the next thing we need to do is provide the arguments. What should the arguments be? Well, it should just be the who we're gonna mint to. So this should just be the address of the user. Oh, this is gonna be the success call, or this is gonna be the proxy call. It returns a success variable, and that's the action. So now, Let's actually do the post conditions. So if the call was successful, then we need to check some certain things. So the first thing we need to do is let's call this the LP token balance after. What this will do here is we're just going to get the balance after the call. Then we're just going to get the reserves, the current reserves after they were updated. So let's go ahead and do after need a comma here. And that's just going to be the same as above pair dot not. There we go. Get reserves. Yes, the linter will soon stop complaining that these are unused. Just be patient, please. Then we're going to actually do our checks. So I'm going to assert here. Let's just think about this. What should we assert? Well, LP tokens were minted, right? So ideally, if this all works correctly, the token balance before should be bigger or should be smaller than the token balance after. So let's go ahead and assert that. How should we assert? Well, First, we need to compute the K after, so let's just do that. Again, there's no risk of overflow. And, well, this is the main thing we wanted to test, right? Providing liquidity increases the pool invariant. So then we should assert that K before is less than K after. Awesome. Oh, my bad. So 
Now we've done the action and the post conditions. Take a quick break, see if there are any questions. No questions, sweet, I'm gonna continue. And so our provide liquidity test is, or our, yeah, our provide liquidity test is pretty much done. We have their preconditions, we have the action, we have the post conditions. Assuming I did not mess up somewhere, let's see how it works. First thing is remember we need a config file when we use Echidna, so I'm gonna create config.yaml, not camel. And since I had these assertions here, I'm going to use Echidna in assertion mode. So let's just specify test mode should be assertion. Let's specify if we need a corpus. Remember, coverage is your friend. So please enable this. Also help us debug. This is just how many transactions I want to go before Echidna starts. Let's just call that 25. And then the test limit is how many runs I want to do. For this example, I'm going to do 10,000 runs. But you can modify this depending on how many runs you feel comfortable with. Maybe a million will you know, obviously give you more certainty because million is bigger than 10,000, as far as I'm aware. Then now we have a config file. We have everything set up. So let's go ahead and open the terminal. And let's go into part three. And let's run this command. So a kid in a test, we're going to run it from the root directory. We're going to pick that contract. And we're going to set this as our config file. To enter, let's analyze the contract. So seems to be going well so far. Let's take a look. Uh, this is a perfect time to pause if anyone has any questions. Awesome, cool. So I know there are 10,000 runs. Just going to let it run to like 7,000 or so. All right. And so we may be thinking right now, everything passed. There hasn't, the fuzzer hasn't broken anything, but remember coverage is your friend. Let's go ahead and check the coverage. Okay. So we have this star, which means that Echidna hit the line successfully. Then we have this R, which means that the transaction reverted. So if we have a star or, and reverts bubble up, so as we can imagine, the fuzzer probably got stuck at this line because it, we wanted to make sure that the call was successful. So the fuzzer got stuck here and the reverts bubbled all the way up. But it could hit this line successfully. It could hit the call successfully. And let's look at the post conditions. It seems as though all of them held. That's pretty good. So. We can have some certainty here that in the 10,000 or so test cases we tried, that Echidna, this invariant should hold. LP tokens were minted correctly, and the K before is less than the K after. So providing liquidity did, in fact, increase the pool invariant. But let's go back, and let's just have some fun and see if we comment out this line and introduce a bug. Let's see if Echidna is really worth its merit, and it'll find it. Let's try. Run it. As you can see, it loaded three transactions from the coverage. Let's pull it up. So far, so well. Things are going fine. Now, this is another time to ask if there are any questions. Awesome. So if things are going well, that's probably not what we wanted, but let's just look at the coverage and see if we can debug what happened. So Echidna continues reverting. It hits these and the assertions seem to pass. Why is that? Well, the token balance before will still be the token balance after and K before will still be the K balance after. The reason is because actually here, we made sure that the amounts are between 1000 and the unit negative one. So actually when we comment out this Line right here, require liquidity is greater than zero. It'll always mint at least, you know, greater than zero tokens, so we won't encounter the bug there. However, one homework exercise I would like everyone to try actually is to play around and see if you can move this these amounts into the into the completed tokens to bound them only when you're minting, and then see if Echidna will catch the bug. And I'm pretty sure it will. So as we can see. We've learned a lot of things in this workshop. 
we've learned about how, basically how to, you know, set up a contract. Well, we've learned about, you know, how to write an echidna test, how to have preconditions, actions, and post conditions. And we also learned a lot about Uniswap's code base, at least the pair contract and the core. So that being said, we tested this invariant and it did work. And I'm going to assign everyone some homework if they're up for it. So your homework, I'm going to push this to GitHub. You can use it as like a setup template. And what I want is I want everyone to think of more invariants and then write their own tests. And you can actually make PRs. And we're, we're going to check them later and see, oh, this is an interesting test. Let's see if it works. Or, oh, you know, like this, like, and we're going to give feedback on those. So, yeah, I'm going to push this code up to GitHub. And it's going to be awesome. Encourage everyone to try just even if you don't want to commit a PR, just clone the repo locally and just try to have some fun, try to write some tests. And yeah, perfect. So there's going to be another workshop next week. I'm going to talk a bit about more about some more complex invariants. We're going to revisit that swap function because right now we just managed to provide liquidity. It's not really that interesting, but now that we've got everything set up, we understand Uniswap, we can just jump right into how the swap function works. We can just jump right into swap invariants, and we can just talk about, you know, maybe how would we use the router, how would we simulate some end-to-end -end tests. So, yeah, encourage everyone to, you know, attend that workshop. It's going to be a lot of fun. I hope everyone enjoyed this one. And also, one last thing is I'd encourage everyone to watch the previous workshops if they haven't already. I know I've said that a bunch, but they would help make you understand. If you got confused when I was writing uh, some of the setup or some of the echidna stuff, it would help make that a lot clearer. So yeah, thank you everyone for attending. And uh, see, oh, there's a question. One second, let me just uh, check the questions really quick. How many runs do you do on an actual audit? Uh, that generally depends. Like when we first want to fuzz something, we just keep it kind of small because, as you can see, sometimes we make a mistake. Sometimes we, you know, like there's uh, we want to understand the system a bit more. And that way, if we keep the run small, we can just iterate quickly. And once we kind of understand the system well, once we have like more fuzz tests written out and once like pretty much everything is completed, like we've tested all the properties we want in the system, then we increase the test limit and that way we can get a lot more coverage. So I would say at the beginning, we just make sure we just keep it kind of small, just make sure because there might, we can iterate very quickly on that. And yeah, I hope that answers your question. But besides that, Thank you everyone for uh, attending and looking forward to coming back next week and working on even more properties.